Hi, welcome to Midweek Connection on Tuesday, October 4th. My name is Pastor Joel. And I'm Natalie. And we're, uh, we're going to read what we normally do. We're going to read our daily lectionary texts and uh, talk about it and pray and see where God might be leading us. Today we're doing it on Tuesday because uh, Tina's going to be out tomorrow and the rest of the week. And so she's usually the one who posts these things. And so she's going to post this one today. So also, uh, reading on a Tuesday gives us slightly different psalms than ordinarily, and so right. we'll get to do a couple different things today. But glad you guys can join us, and we're going to start with Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep with the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Our Hebrew prophetic text today is coming from Hosea chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. Ephraim mixes himself with the peoples. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Foreigners devour his strength, but he does not know it. Gray hairs are sprinkled upon him, but he does not know it. Israel's pride testifies against him, yet they do not return to the house of their God or seek him for all this. Ephraim has become like a dove, silly and without sense, they call upon Egypt, they go to Assyria. As they go, I will cast my net over them. I will bring them down like birds of the air. I will discipline them according to the report made to their assembly. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Destruction to them, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. They gash themselves for grain and wine. They rebel against me. It was I who trained and strengthened their arms, yet they plot evil against me. They turn to that which does not profit. They have become like a defective bow. Their officials shall fall by the sword because of the rage of their tongue, so much for their babbling in the land of Egypt. And from Acts, we'll read chapter 23, verses 12 through 24. In the morning, the Jews joined in a conspiracy and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. 
There were more than 40 who joined in this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the council must notify the tribune to bring him down to you on the pretext that you want to make a more thorough examination of his case, and we are ready to do away with him before he arrives. Now the son of Paul's sister heard about the ambush, so he went and gained entrance to the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to report to him. So he took him, brought him to the tribune, and said, The prisoner Paul called me and asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to tell you. The tribune looked at him, took him by the hand, drew him aside privately, and asked, What is it that you have to report to me? He answered, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire more thoroughly into his case. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than forty of their men are lying in ambush for him. They have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink until they kill him. They are ready now and are waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, ordering him, Tell no one that you have informed me of this. Then he summoned two of the centurions and said, Get ready to leave by nine o'clock tonight for Caesarea with two hundred soldiers, seventy horsemen, and two hundred spearmen. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and take him safely to Felix the governor. Our gospel text today is from Luke chapter 7 verses 1 through 17. After Jesus had finished all his sayings and the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to come to you, but only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I am a, also a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the buyer, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. In our psalm, it's Psalm 102. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is stricken and withered like grass. I am too wasted to eat my bread. Because of my loud groaning, my bones cling to my skin. I am like an owl of the wilderness, like a little owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I am like a lonely bird on the housetop. All day long my enemies taunt me. Those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle tears with my drink. Because of your indignation and anger, for you have lifted me up and thrown me aside. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. Your name endures to all generations. You will rise up and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to favor it. The appointed time has come. 
For your servants hold its stones dear and have pity on its dust. The nations will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth your glory. For the Lord will build up Zion. He will appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and will not despise their prayer. Let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet unborn may praise the Lord, that he looked down from his holy height. From heaven, the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, so that the name of the Lord may be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord, he has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. O oh my God, I say, do not take me away at the midpoint of my life, you whose years endure throughout all generations. Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you endure. They will all wear out like a garment. You change them like clothing, and they pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall live secure. Their offspring shall be established in your presence. And our final psalm today is Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I think I want to start with the Acts passage today, um, and I think because having read through Acts before and being familiar with, you know, Paul is in Jerusalem, and, and we even talked about it this last week, this whole uh, made-up charges against Paul, all of the insinuations that Paul was uh, going against the temple and the... Um, the ritual purity and all these kind of things. Um, and so this is a continuation of that story where, where Paul was uh, Paul was essentially arrested, but arrested for his own safekeeping. And, right. and he's been in jail for a long time. And, and, um, and there's this, and so this whole section here with uh, Paul's nephew hearing about this ambush that's being planned and there is this grand conspiracy of 40 people that have sworn to not eat again until they kill Paul. Um, and, and I wonder about it, just in terms of if these are you know, the religious people or these religious zealots that are in Jerusalem and they are vowing to kill um, Paul, whose only crime is that he's been talking about Jesus as the fulfillment of the uh, you know, messianic prophecies, uh, where the accusations of his ritual impurity or whatever, they're, they're false and baseless anyway, because we know that Paul um, really continued to adhere to, to, those, um, to those ritual things. Um, uh, and, and I just I find it fascinating that so much time is devoted to the telling of the story, and then the nephew going to the to the Tribune, and the nephew talking. It's like in this whole description. It just seems like a lot of space in Scripture uh, to talk about something that just seems so mundane in a way. And I'm kind of just wondering if you had any thoughts on it because I'm trying to figure out how it might relate to anything else. <laughs> well, it's just. I don't, I don't know that I have anything that necessarily... <laughs> right. I find it curious that they, like you said, they are the religious leaders, and yet they were so, like... Why did they feel they're, so they're threatened? They're focused on violence. Yeah, they right. feel so threatened. And, I'm like, and, and yet they are the ones... They know the Old Testament. They would know the Ten Commandments. I mean, right. that's... Right. Like, we're, gonna, we're not going to eat until we kill you. So right. we just pick and choose what we want to do and where we want to. And so we hold you to this vow. standard. Right. right. And so it is kind of curious that yeah. they are so. 
So, you know, going back to the Luke passage where, where again, we, we find this, um, you know, here are the Romans that are currently protecting Paul, and the Romans are then going to, you know, take 200 horsemen, and, I mean, 200 soldiers and 70 horsemen, and, and slip out in the dead of night and get down to Caesarea where there's another uh, barracks where Paul could be safe, you know, this whole transit thing. Right. Um, and, and here are the Romans acting like the heroes of the story, or at least are, you know, participants in a positive way right. in the story. They, right, they and are. So you jump back to the Luke passage, and again, here's this centurion who, uh, who was somebody apparently who um, at least wasn't uh, abusing the Jewish people that right. he was responsible for. He actually built their synagogue, he seemed kind. These people are like Jesus. He's okay. He's worthy to be healed. Um, and then here's a centurion who actually demonstrates greater faith than other Jews at that time. Jesus, just say the word and my slave will be healed. I believe right. you can do it. And, and that is brought about. He, he, he's, his faith is extolled by Jesus as being greater than anybody else in Israel. Um, and then Jesus then goes to the town of Nain and heals this man, uh, this young man, to provide, uh, you know, give his, him back to life so that his mother would have uh, someone to, to provide for him. Um, and so we're, we're seeing, like, People out of women. ordinary things. Right. People who may not have heard the gospel or don't believe the gospel, have not been participants in the gospel up until this point, but yet mm -hmm. they are playing roles that have a part in the furthering of the gospel. I mean, mm -hmm. Paul is protected in that he can continue to go out and proclaim. Right. Um, the centurion is cared for by Jesus, even though he would not be the, you know, the, the religious ordinary, thing, right, right the, the expected recipient of the blessings. Right. So it, it is fascinating how that the Luke 7 passage does follow immediately after uh, Jesus and his teachings on the, on the, the, on the plane. Um, the whole, blessed are you who are poor, blessed are you who are hungry, blessed are you who weep, you know, because you're going to, yours of the kingdom, you're going to be filled, you're going to laugh. Um, but the rest of that, uh, condensed sermon talking about loving for enemies. Don't judge other people by their external experience, uh, uh, their external appearance. Uh, the tree and its fruit. No bad tree bears good fruit, and vice versa. Um, and that whole idea of why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you. And then immediately comes a centurion who's demonstrating that even non-Jewish people can accomplish these things. Right. And the question is, well, why are they doing those things? Um, or, uh, you know, have they been exposed to the teachings of Jesus prior to this? Or have they been students of, of the Old Testament scriptures? Um, you know, and I think that's where, you know, jumping back to Hosea, you know, we, we, we see the... Um, we see the woes being pronounced against Ephraim. Uh, Ephraim at this point is, uh, you know, one of the one of the tribes of Israel that uh, God had obviously pr uh, promised good things to happen, and mm -hmm. here they are experiencing these woes, and uh, how Ephraim is, uh, in this sense, looking for political and military salvation from Egypt. And how God's like, that's not going to be enough, you know, because it's right. not a matter of uh, do you have enough military alliances? Is, is your heart in the right place? Right. Are you actually doing what I have commanded you to do? Um, I think, I think, I think we're just getting, uh, you know, the the surprise even at. Just as the as the un, uh, unexpected cast of characters who are doing the right thing, and the and the expected cast of characters doing the wrong thing, and how how when Jesus shows up, there seems to be this reversal right. that's taken place. 
Hmm. And, and you made the comment about, you know, the, with the heart and, and with your heart in the right place and, you know, the centurion. I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that, but. Right. Um, well, but I think, even, well, yeah, go ahead. No, go, no. Well, I was just thinking, you know, you know, the, the verse 7, I'm sorry, chapter 7, 14 of Hosea, you know, they, they do not cry to me from the heart. But they wail upon their beds and they gash themselves for grain and wine. You know, they rebel against me. Um, uh, again, I think we're seeing, you know, what, what are the conditions of our hearts? Like, they, like uh, Ephraim is not crying out to God, but right. pursuing uh, material gain from a foreign land. Right. Which is not what God's people were called to do. Right. And so, you know, so going to the Acts passage again, where the Jews are taking vows to kill, which is very contrary. You know, you said, you know, they're in the Ten Commandments. They're aware of that. Thou shalt not kill, right? right? Um, taking vows to kill, where it's the Romans that are protecting. Uh, uh, you got the crowds following Jesus, but he's healing a Roman centurion and a widow from Maine. Uh, people that you just wouldn't expect to receive the blessings. The people you expect to get the blessings don't get them, and the people that you don't expect do. Right. Yeah. I think maybe maybe one of the reasons why we're struggling, and, I, and, 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 and it's, it's because it's still, in many ways, um, it conflicts with what I think our understanding of the ordinary is. And I, and I think this is, uh, this is an ongoing challenge uh, for people of faith, how do we recognize uh, that God is up to something that is ordinarily different than what we would ordinarily expect? And I think if you look at the world in general, um, who are the people that the world exalts? You know, the world likes to put uh, you know people on pedestals for any number of reasons, but it tends to be you know, the rich or the famous or the talented or uh, the beautiful or the young or whatever it might happen to be. Um, and then when something out of the ordinary happens, we kind of rebel against it. And so I think even as people of faith, because we are so ingrained in our own cultural understandings of who are, who are supposed to be the heroes and who are supposed to be the villains. And then when Jesus does something different, or when we see something different in scripture, um, our own cultural uh, immersion even right. comes out. You know, we're like, we're looking at this passage and we're going, wait, what are you doing this again? It's just like, well, wait, it's, it's what God is ordinarily doing. Why should we then not start to expect the unexpected when you draw closer to Jesus? Right, and I, going back to that Luke passage, you know, you said this. It's interesting that this the story of the centurion, and then this this um, the raising of this widow's son. And if you go prior to that, back in chapter six, and you have the the blessings and the woes and the love for enemies, it's all of these things that he's teaching and preaching, but then he demonstrates them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that. Um, yes, it is unexpected, just like you said, and, and they, we have players in here that don't play the typical roles that we feel like they should play, but in that as well, we see Jesus doing exactly what he is calling us to do. Right. Um, you have the centurions, and then even the, the Romans um, there in the Acts passage, you have these people that are not... They don't fit, I guess, to the stereotype that they would have been given at that time period. They don't fit into that stereotype because they're not they're acting against that. But even beyond that, it's it was still there was still this division. They were the centurions, they were the Romans, they were the it doesn't matter what labels you put on them. It matters that you care for them and Jesus provided care. Mm -hmm. And for the, the widow was someone that would have been excluded, right? Right. And yeah. so you have Jesus demonstrating exactly what he's calling us to do mm -hmm. and so that Jesus doesn't just talk the talk he walks the walk is that right. what we're saying right and he, you know for all mm -hmm. for all it you know you can't get put into you don't get a label and then oh well we put you up on the shelf and this right. is who you are and this is what you deserve right all right and or this is who you are and so because you because you're Jewish, 
you right. get this, you know, the Jewish people, you know, we're, they've taken this vow to kill him. That wouldn't have given them a free pass. Right. That didn't excuse their bad behavior. That didn't excuse their, right. um, the things that they were going to do right. that were against what God would call us to do. So mm. you don't get free passes based on who you are. You don't get excluded based on who you are. Mm. It's... Right. Um, you know. here's, here's the sermon, here's the application. You yeah. know, I'm doing something different and I'm going to do something different. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm telling you right. about it. I'm telling you about it. And so, um, you know, in, in, light of, in light of the Psalms that we, you know, read, you know, even jumping back to Psalm 42, the first one we did, everybody, everybody loves the first part of that Psalm, right? You know, right. As a deer longs for low flowing stream, so my soul longs for you. As my soul thirsts for God, the living God. But then the whole rest of the thing is just like, wait, wait, where is, where are you, God? Yeah. Like I'm in real trouble here. And this is and so so sometimes I wonder, like, you know, we if you take a couple of verses that are very beautiful, don't get me wrong, I, I love that song. It's right. a great song. But the whole rest of the psalm here um, is really one of true depth of longing. Why is your soul longing for God? It's like, well, at this point, God appears to be absent. There's just a little bit of uh, my soul being cast down within me, all of the stuff. So again, I think um, you know the, the Psalms are really good at explaining human conditions for us and how uh, sometimes maybe in our lives we like to kind of sugarcoat faith as in it's, oh, it's all good. And as long as I sing happy songs, uh, then my life will be happy. Uh, I don't right. think Psalm 42 is necessarily happy. It's hopeful because God, right. you know, he does he does believe that God will be his help. Does believe that God will be his God. Right. But in the but in the midst of that, it's there's some sorrow. There's some the reason why he's longing is because he feels kind of the absence of God. So again. Right. In our culture, we probably like to think, hey, if I'm doing all the right things, then I'm going to experience all the right blessings. Or right. If, if, I, if I have you know, enough God in my life, then everything I do is going to be blessed. And, and we're experiencing a little bit in the Psalm 42, just something different. And so I think it's okay and it's healthy and it's even expected to wrestle with it. Right. Because uh, God is always confronting us. Not confronting is not the right word. Um, uh, God is always, uh, you know, um, teaching us, revealing Himself to us in in ways that challenge our assumptions in order to really prove more of who He is. And then, how do we faithfully respond to that? And I think people get so caught up in in that idea like you said when we were being we're receiving blessings and things will be easy so i think sometimes people get so caught up in when they are facing difficult times thinking that well i'm, I'm dealing with this tough stuff and nothing seems to be going my way well i must be doing something wrong mm -hmm. because you know god wouldn't let me experience this or and when we are um facing that that transformation sometimes that is difficult and those are difficult times and that doesn't mm. necessarily mean that we're doing anything wrong sometimes we're right. doing exactly what mm. we're supposed to be doing mm. and sometimes those can be those difficult times can be the most transformative and and we come out the other side um changed in a mm. way that could only have happened through those difficult times and could only you know we are changed in and transformed more into that image through those difficult times but people get so wrapped up and, and the world tells us that everything you know should be going great everything you know everything is shiny and glossy and and, and you put on your you put on your happy face and, and that's the, what that's the image that we project to the world right. and if that's not what we are living I think people think sometimes they're doing something wrong mm -hmm. but that longing, that longing, especially in those difficult times, you know, I, I think that's okay to long. Yeah. I think to, but it, it is certainly okay to go through those difficult times, right. and it doesn't right. mean that you're doing anything wrong. Right. I think that yeah, that's yeah, I think that's a great point, Natalie. Um, uh, 
where does God meet us when we are doing the right thing, but it doesn't feel necessarily as good as we hoped that it would. Right. Um, I think if, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we we have all experienced uh, times when uh, things don't make sense, or um, you know, despite your best efforts, things aren't going the way that you hope that they would go. Um, and 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 how do you even how do we even learn to put words to those feelings of disappointment or or the sorrow sometimes? Right. Um, and I think this is again where these psalms usually have some of hope in there, a confidence that God's promises are true. Um, and, and, you know, again, if we, look at, if we look at the life of Jesus, we see how he did a practical application to his teaching. You know, it, it, you know Luke 6 is, is, is hard teaching, mm -hmm. and then Jesus went and did it. And so he's calling us to do the same. The teachings are true. The lessons are true. And they're hard. They're they're hard sometimes. Um, but think about how um, you know recorded for all of Scripture the faith of the centurion, the the blessing that Jesus gave to the widow by raising the son to new life. Um, and uh, think about what story God is telling in in your life, in my life. Um, uh, what what will we get to reflect on forever in heaven? And it's just like wow. Uh, God was with me in the midst of those really difficult times, and my longing for Him has been satisfied fully. Right. That the the aim for for unity from you know the Psalm uh, one thirty three, uh, just yes, it's a it's a blessed thing when this happens. But at the same time, uh, we know that we don't always act in unity with one another. So it's, 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 yes, it's a description of what blessing is going to be like, but it's also a yearning for it. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting with some of these, these narratives and how do they all fit together. But, um, again, I think if we could take kind of one lesson from it, God's always doing some unexpected things through, through Jesus. And, um, and so if something's unexpected going on in your life, it doesn't mean God is absent. It just means God is working in a different way to transform us into the people we have us to be from a, from a different perspective. So uh, good stuff today. Right. Always encouraging. Thank you, Natalie, for your time. Would you, uh, did I even open us in prayer this time? Did I? I don't, I don't think you did. I don't think I did. I think <laughs> I just started reading. Well, why don't you close us in prayer? All right. All right. Okay. I can do that. Gracious Father, um, thank you for your words to us today. Um, difficult words. Um, difficult words in um, sometimes finding understanding. And I just pray that um, when we read things like this, that uh, you do reveal yourself to us and you reveal what it is that you would have us to hear. Um, I pray that those of us that are um, facing difficulties, our longings, that that we, we do, we long for you, that we cry out to you, that we um, are comforted by you and um, in the hope, um, the knowledge of the hope that we can have in you, knowing that you are, you are with us in, um, in those daily trials and struggles um, and that you are at work always in each of us. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. I hope you guys have a great day. And if you do have any questions or concerns, do feel free to call the church and we'd be happy to listen to you and, and pray with you. And uh, certainly believe that uh, God is with us in the midst of our challenges and struggles. So thanks for joining us with today. Thank you. Bye-bye.